Water is life here in New Mexico, and without water, we don't have our traditional communities, we don't have our cities, we don't have agriculture, and we don't have a future in this state. The water's coming right now, so it's gonna be pretty crazy. Let me see if I can jump in here and start to clean up this track. It's important to remember how that water, or the lack of it, impacts all of us. Now we're gonna run it down the mother ditch to the compuertas where it divides, huh? We have the acequias up north that divert a small amount of water to the fields so they can grow their fields. Farming communities which had sustainable agricultural practices. We started this cleanup a little bit over a week ago, cleaning all the shrubs coming through and cleaning out the big pockets of sand and big piles of leaves. And then you can see how nice it looks now. My mom would always tell me in 1955, the Santa Cruz River dried up and they had to go down to the Rio Grande and haul water in barrels in the carts to come and put a cup of water on each plant. But we always have to be able to adapt to the changing environment, the changing weather patterns. And this is part of what we're doing. The people survive 400 years because they're able to change to what needs to be done to survive. One of the things that scientists have been telling us for a long time about climate change is we're going to see less snowpack, snowpack further north, and an earlier spring melt. We see that exactly this year. If temperatures increase uh, by three, four, five degrees, even seven degrees per century, the effect of that on snowpack in the southwest will be dire. We expect to see very little snowpack at all by the end of the century south of the Sangre de Cristos. And in the headwaters of major rivers in southern Colorado, we expect snowpack declines of 50% or thereabouts. It'll come off early, it'll dissipate quickly. We won't have the flows in the river for the farmers, for our agriculture, but also for all the wildlife that lives up and down this river. When we're thinking about protecting communities, protecting health, and protecting the environment, it's so important to understand the way that different natural resources are linked together. The integrity of the landscapes and the habitat is everything. If we don't have big tracts of very healthy, vibrant habitat, elk, mule, mule deer, bighorn sheep, their numbers suffer tremendously. So in the 21st century in New Mexico, it's been dry, and we use the word drought to describe it, but really this is kind of a permanent new state of affairs. We have less water, we can expect that going forward. Climate change reduces the available water supply, and increases the evaporation, or snow melts off and evaporates sooner. Climate change is really bad for our water supply. This farm is a farm I've been tending for 40 some years now. And right now we're in the middle of the hottest and the driest winter I've ever seen here. Unless the weather really changes, unless we get a lot of snow in February and, and March, um, we're going to have hell to pay this summer in fire, bark beetles, irrigation water shortage, and drought stress and heat stress generally. It's always a mistake to confuse weather with climate, but these kinds of conditions are exactly what we expect here in the Southwest with climate change. We're looking at a hotter and drier future because of climate change, because of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and because of fossil fuel consumption. No two ways about it, the science is clear. There's no doubt that the temperature is getting warmer across the Southwest. We can show with um, standard temperature records that the temperature averaged over the state of New Mexico over the entire year is about three degrees warmer now than it was 40 years ago on average. The temperature at the Earth's surface depends on a couple of different things. The Earth is heated by the sun, 
but it's also heated from heat that's absorbed by the atmosphere and re-radiated back down. And that depends on greenhouse gases, such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane. They all contribute in known ways to keeping the Earth's surface warm. So when we increase the concentration of greenhouse gases, as we know is happening because we can measure it, there really is nothing else that can happen to the temperature other than, on average, the temperature goes up. Because of these trends, there will be significant declines in the average flow of major rivers like the Rio Grande. That potentially represents a major challenge for irrigated agriculture, which depends heavily on supplies of Rio Grande river water throughout the state. This muddy river here feeds all the people, all the wildlife here in New Mexico. Well, we don't have a snowpack, and we have an early runoff. These coyotes that we saw, these ducks, these deer, this is their home, they live here. Their home's gone. Climate change is the symptom of our disconnectedness with one another, with the natural world, and uh, a preoccupation with a throwaway culture. I've noticed the justice elements with climate change. The most economically challenged would suffer the most in the future and would not have water. Social justice and environmentalism go hand in hand, and it's about caring for God's people and it's about caring for God's creation. Our region, the Southwest, has always had drought. But what's going to be different in the future is that the droughts of the future are going to be crueler and tougher than those of the past because the weather's going to be hotter. And hotter means more evaporation. And not even the United States Congress can repeal the law of evaporation. A little increase in temperature produces a big increase in evaporative force. And that means that the stress on all these trees, these grasses, everything around here is going to go up and up and up with the increased evaporation of the hotter future. And that's what partly guarantees us the future catastrophe of fire. I'm Tom Swetnam, and uh, I was born here in New Mexico. I'm a native New Mexican, and I live here in the Hamas Mountains. I grew up here in these forests, watching them change over the last 50 years. Las Conchas fire started right at the base of that mountain over there, and it was hot and dry, really hot, dry year in 2011, and the wind was blowing, and within an hour or so, that fire had raged up that mountain slope and burned over the top of the mountain, and there were 500 to 800 foot tall flames coming off the tops of those trees at the very top there, so five or six times the height of those trees. It was like a whirlwind, a cloud of smoke spinning and at the bottom flames coming up. And so this thing was moving faster than your usual fire. I mean, it just roared down the mesa tops and burned at a severity level that we haven't seen before on this landscape. The Las Conchas fire was a fire of the new age shaped by climate change, by the increased heat, the increased evaporation. In the first 14 hours of the Las Conchas fire, the fire consumed one acre every second. That added up to 40,000 acres in 14 hours. People in New Mexico, no firefighter, had ever seen a fire like that in New Mexico before. It's those kinds of phenomena that we can expect to have more of in the climate changed future. These are devastating to wildlife. They, not only do they destroy the habitat 
they kill the wildlife. They kill what they eat, where they live. And then following that, when we do get rains, we have tremendous erosion and it, it just wipes out the, the landscape. In a lot of these areas, you're burning off the forest and you're losing the capacity for the forest to regenerate. Instead, we're getting back our shrubs and grasses. And then also, you see all the dead trees laying around. This is a lot of fuel. So this landscape will burn again. And that's what's happening here in the Hamas Mountains and elsewhere in the Southwest. We're not just burning once, we're burning twice or three times over the same landscape. So climate change is driving the fires in the first place, and it's also inhibiting the forest from regenerating in these landscapes. Methane uh, emissions are a significant contributor in the short term to climate change. About a quarter of uh, the, the climate change that we're already experiencing is directly attributable to methane pollution. Methane's a huge problem. It's a potent greenhouse gas. And so what we need to do when you look at the oil and gas industry and the leakage of methane is make sure to keep that to a minimum. It's a very simple idea. I mean, basically what we're talking about is waste. You could heat the entire city of Chicago with the methane that has been wasted. We were identified as the methane hotspot of the United States, a methane hotspot the size of Delaware hovering above the Four Corners region. The topography and the mountains are there and they're going to stay there. The, the winds are not going to change. The only control you have to reduce the hotspot and the pollution are the emissions. If we don't become better stewards for the planet that we live on, um, some of the fundamental systems may indeed break down. I think that we all have a responsibility to take on climate change, but especially those of us in the United States and myself and my family, we have to own up to the fact that we have a larger carbon footprint than a lot of other people in the rest of the world especially, and that we have to recognize that our impact on the environment has been uh, overwhelmingly negative in the last couple of years, and we need to own up to that and start making steps to improve it. Under the current administration, it's given New Mexico more responsibility to take action and be a leader as a state and hopefully influence the entire country. So what I would like to see personally is a move away from treating a changing climate as a political issue and start to think about technological, practical solutions to managing it. What worries me most about climate change is that it's not an accepted issue you know, with a lot of people. The fact that it's debated causes a lot of problems and we really just need to work towards a goal to fix it instead of arguing whether it's real. If we think like engineers and scientists, we can deal with this. If we get mired in political debates uh, over nonsense, then we're wasting time. And I think that if we don't take really good care of these things and we get into these giant drought cycles and these giant wildfire fire cycles, I think 50 and 100 years from now, we're gonna see catastrophic impacts to these really, really critical resources and, and, and landscape and water systems. And it's up to us as generational stewards of these resources to make sure that our children have something that they can physically live in. Despite all of these problems, I actually do have some hope for the future, and that comes from seeing our young people in New Mexico who understand climate change probably better than most adults do, and who are thinking about real solutions for the future and not just doing things the same way that we've been doing it for generations. Sometimes we're not recognized. However, in this day and age, when teenagers are more than ever being recognized for their political actions, I think that there's a really real possibility that people like us can help influence our government. I'm really hopeful that our generation is united on this issue and that we're not separated by our backgrounds. We all know that climate change is a huge issue and that we all have to come together and work together to solve it. People ask me fairly often whether I am hopeful and I give that question a lot of thought but in the end I think it's the wrong question. The, the question should not be are you hopeful the question should be, what are you going to do next? What is your plan? How are you going to help? 
Everybody needs to put their shoulder to the problem and push as hard as they can. Can we just come together?